Good evening, everyone. My name is David, and welcome to another of ACPP's webinars and the continuation of a regular set of professional development opportunities the college will be running. Before we begin, I'd like to please acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands where my Australian-based colleagues are located today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. In recognition that we are a bi-national college, I take this opportunity to acknowledge the Maori as Tangata Whanua and the Treaty of Waitangi Partners in Aotearoa New Zealand. This evening, I have the pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Duncan McConnell. Duncan is a senior paramedic and educator with over 25 years experience and has a passion for remote and complex paramedicine. Duncan's history includes assisting with the development of ambulance services in the Maldives and Mongolia, working in various clinical and managerial roles within the Queensland Ambulance Service. Duncan was the inaugural program director and senior lecturer of the Griffith University Bachelor of Paramedicine and is currently working as the clinical manager of St John Northern Territory. Duncan will be talking about paramedicine delivery in remote Indigenous communities and the role that complex primary care paramedicine and paramedic practitioners could play in the future models of remote health care. At the end of the presentation, there will be a short Q&A. If anyone watching live uh, have any questions, I'll encourage you to please write them into the comments section and I'll go through them in the order that they appear. Without any further delay, I'd like to please pass the webinar on to Duncan. Thanks, mate. Thanks, David, and um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so yeah, the uh, purpose of today's webinar is we, yeah, we're going to look at um, remote and Indigenous healthcare, um, mainly focusing on my time up here in the Northern Territory. Um, so working in the Never Never. Um, so if uh, anyone's read that classic Australian novel, um, it really uh, describes what it's like um, to work up here in rural and remote locations. Uh, so just like uh, David mentioned earlier, um, also acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we live and work on. I'm coming to you from uh, Larrakia land. Uh, they have the traditional custodians of the land um, within here, and I'm going to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today and for our friends that are following with us over in New Zealand. So before, um, before I get started, I've got um, a little bit of a, an idea of what it's like um, working up here in this capacity. Uh, look, we've only got a short time this evening. Um, this topic we could talk on for hours. So I'm just touching on some key points and some key areas. And if there's something that um, isn't mentioned or you've got a burning question, drop it in the chat like David suggested, and we can cover that um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so that's just a quick uh, snippet on what the challenges are like and what the uh, area we work in is like up here. So some of you may have visited the Northern Territory. Um, some of you may not have. Uh, it's uh, located uh, above South Australia to the left of Queensland and to the right of WA. Uh, the Northern Territory itself has a land size of 1.4 million square kilometres and that's twice the size of Texas. Population of only 246,500 people. That was based in September 2020. Um, I'm sure it certainly swelled during the COVID period when everyone from down south came up to uh, spend their time up here due to the restrictions that uh, didn't really exist. Um, and there are over the entire territory five hospitals. Um, and you can see that they're located in Darwin, Nullumboy, um, Catherine, Tennant Creek, and Alice Springs. And that's quite a uh, significant uh, distance uh, from Darwin to Alice on its own is about uh, 12 to 1300 kilometres. Um, Tennant Creek is about 800. Um, Catherine is about 300 and Nullumboy is about, um, it's about 600. So quite a vast uh, spread of area. Now focusing on what we're talking about today and looking at um, remote health um, within uh, Aboriginal um, territorians is that um, 
as of June um, 2017, it was just shy of uh, 75,000 uh, residing um, here. And that's about 30% of our overall population. Um, and it's only 10% of the total Aboriginal population. If you do a bit of a, a, bit of a research um, review, um, Queensland and New South Wales actually have the biggest um, population across Australia. And it represents about 70% of consumers to public hospital services. Um, and they are quite a significant group um, across hospital, health services, ambulance, across the whole territory. And there are many reasons for that. Um, lower health literacy, um, ability to access um, areas, and sometimes leaving their homelands, it, it can be quite a struggle to get back because of the um, chronic diseases um, or conditions they might be suffering. They can't get the care that they require in the homeland. That can present us with some other challenges as well, which we'll touch on later. Um, high rates of social disadvantage, low levels of health literacy, as I just mentioned, um, this does lead to that higher rate of poor health and mortality compared to non-Aboriginal Territorians. And these are things that we see in the pre-hospital environment, we see in the primary healthcare space, and we see in the hospital space. Um, and when you first sort of arrive up here, if you've ever worked in environments like this, um, you do tend to get a little bit of a shock. Um, and it's trying to work through that and identify ways in which you can continue and improve your practice so that the shock becomes a core part of how you actually approach. So knowing that potentially you uh, might need to adjust your approach, your level of patient care, your, the, the understanding of how you approach each section or each issue uh, needs to take a different consideration. And they are quite a proud people uh, and they do, um, they do value the input that we're able to provide um, in putting their healthcare foot first. Um, the one thing that is noticed up here is that they are a lot younger than your non-Aboriginal population up here in the NT. Um, with um, most of them being 24 years of age, and that is really due to the high birth rate and life expectancy experience up here, um, given the chronic um, disease and other issues that, are, that um, account for some of the health challenges that they face. Uh, we're generally seeing things that you would see in a, um, in a high health literate uh, location, what you might consider seeing in like 65 to sort of 80 year old patient space, you're seeing in the 35 to 40 year old um, indigenous space up here. And I do remember speaking with um, Dr. Steve Rashford uh, from Queensland Ambulance, the, the medical director down there, and he did some time in Alice Springs many years ago. and. Um, a bit of um, key information that stuck with him as a young resident was exactly that, in that what you would consider um, in a 70-year-old um, patient working in um, Brisbane or Melbourne or Sydney, um, you would expect those similar conditions in a 35 to 40-year-old patient. That stuck with me when I, when I took my position up here. So looking at um, some of the challenges that we face uh, up here when we're dealing with it from a health perspective, is that there's over a hundred different Aboriginal languages spoken here in the NT. And that's just in our small little area. And remember the population is only 246 odd thousand. So, and within that small population, there's a hundred different Aboriginal languages spoken. So communication with, um, with our Indigenous patients can be quite a challenge. Um, and the ways in which we have adapted um, to dealing with that um, obviously translating through people that um, have a little bit of health literacy to be able to explain, or even transitioning how we actually approach um, conditions that may be presenting with us. Um, changing the way we talk about shortness of breath. Um, often a common term that's been adopted up here is various levels of short wind. So someone that says they're very short wind, that means they're very short of breath or little short wind. Um, paining as, a word, as opposed to do you have pain the terminology of painting, different ways in which we try to communicate. And I can tell you it is quite a challenge. And it's a big challenge um, from the healthcare perspective, because even something as simple as getting patient details and having a consistent understanding of what that is um, can be quite a challenge. 
Uh, we do utilize a form of electronic patient record keeping up here where we can do a population search based on the patient's name and date of birth, which can bring some of that information in, which does help sort of break down some of that language barriers. And we are currently investigating um, from a pre-hospital care space, but already in the pre in the primary health care space is the uh, healthcare record, uh, which is used quite extensively in our um, Aboriginal um, communities to help alleviate some of those challenges. Um, and again, we've got the inherent challenges right in the geography, um, climate, um, and where communities are spread all over the territory. Uh, it's it's quite a sparse uh, area that we work in, and, and and it's not uncommon to be a good 300 kilometres between some of these um, communities, and that's a short distance. Um, so yeah, it can it can often take a good three hour drive or a a one hour flight in an aircraft just to get between communities. So those present their unique challenges as, as well. And other things such as telemedicine and um, using volunteers and things like that. I mean, telemedicine is a great thing, but if you lose your connectivity or there's a blackout or the power source goes, then um, you lose that, that aspect as well. So that can put a bit of a challenge in some of those areas too. And then we've got our areas of chronic disease. Um, and you can see from these stats that we've got from NT Health, that um, between 11 and 15, they made up nearly two thirds of the death in the NT for chronic diseases such as cancer, diabetes and respiratory disease. And that falls back to that previous slide that talks about the challenges faced with um, the population being the younger end of the spectrum due to the high rates of death. And two thirds of death in the NT related to chronic disease, that, that's some big numbers, that's a lot. That's not an insignificant number on its own. So what are some of the things that we're sort of looking at here to help improve that. So what are the sort of, um, where are ways in which we can improve um, health literacy across things such as infectious diseases um, that can lead to these chronic conditions? Rheum uh, rheumatic heart disease, that's just something that I did study in both my masters and working as a paramedic and other aspects over the years. And it wasn't until I sort of came up here, I actually started to see um, some of these chronic conditions that we didn't see much of in your more established sort of eastern seaboard um, sort of ambulance services because of the um, well-managed um, disease management process. With the lower health literacy here, like managing some of these chronic conditions is not managed well. Um, it's, it's quite common to turn up to someone that's missed three, four, or even seven dialysis appointments and suddenly they're, they're, they're a bit dizzy and lightheaded and not feeling too well. Um, so when you're communicating with these patients, um, both from a primary care, a pre-hospital space, or even the hospital space, these are some of the things that we add to our initial um, questioning that you wouldn't even give consideration for in some other healthcare environments. And other areas, uh, challenges that, would, that, that make dealing um, and managing these patients too is really targeting those culturally appropriate public health approaches to improve health population. Um, and it's an area I want to touch on as an opportunity of growth in which I feel that uh, potentially within this paramedic practitioner and community paramedic space, we really have an opportunity, not just here in the NT, but in other parts of Australia and in some of the research I've been doing towards my PhD in ways in which that we can target culturally appropriate public health approaches um, to provide sustainability and growth in our management and delivery of healthcare in these areas. And that can help bring down these levels of diseases, particularly in these remote and um, distant locations. And then longer term care and management um, of old Aboriginal priests is becoming an increasing challenge. Um, they don't want to leave country. And, and why would they? That's their home. That's where they've grown up. That's where they live. Um, and providing um, some thinking outside the box opportunities, which is where I think the paramedic practitioner and community paramedicine space can really take on its own, in which we might be able to um, increase the ability of long-term care and management options for these older Aboriginal people within communities and give them that right to stay, give them that right to be connected with their land and and their family and their kinship, because that's something, it's a real key aspect of their culture. And it, it's an aspect that really over the years that just going in there with, to use the term quite broadly, white man's medicine and thinking it's going to fix everything. It, 
it doesn't fit that that connection to country it doesn't connect that connection with community the family kinship they're connecting with their ancestry they have the spiritual mind and the body and how all that links together um very proud people very welcoming some of the most welcoming people i've ever met and had the privilege to be able to be work amongst and and help develop some of these processes moving forward so these are some of the many challenges that are faced and if we look at homeland communities this is just a bit of a snapshot um i tried to get um a more in-depth looking but as you can see from this picture here it is a little bit fuzzy so i do apologize but all those different colors all those different shapes um, represent all the different um, areas and homeland communities that are here uh, within the nt at the moment and you can see it's quite it's quite a lot um, and about 500 homelands in the northern territory with about 2400 homes um, all together okay so it's quite a lot um, and many of those are remote. Many of those are in locations that can take a minimum of three hours to get to by car. And around 10,000 people live um, within the homelands and they want to stay there. Um, they don't want to come in. They don't, they don't want to come into areas that take them away from their connection to home and country. While others live in smaller family groups and these are in some of the smaller locations as well. But an issue with that is sometimes um, depending on the nature of the healthcare problem in question, um, sometimes these people need to come to like a central location, like an Alice Springs or like a, a Darwin to actually get some of that care that they required. And that ends up having a long grassing um, kind of process where they come in from the homeland, they have their treatment and sometimes have trouble getting back out to the homelands. They either can't afford it or they're not able to um, get back out there for whatever reason. And that then accounts for long grassing is basically a term used for living um, homeless, so to speak, within various areas of the territory. So there's anyone that's been up in Darwin, any park or public space where there's the ability to actually sort of sleep or lay down, that's sort of where they, they affiliate. Those people that have been to Alice Springs, the Todd, it barely, it barely flows. And when it's not flowing, that's a key area of where those people will actually long grass and live outside their homeland communities, waiting for that opportunity to return home. And that sort of now brings us to our pre-hospital response. And it's quite a multifaceted um, response within the Northern Territory. Um, St. John itself is an NGO. Royal Flying Doctors is an NGO. Care Flight's an NGO. There's no state-based um, primary pre-hospital care delivery network or ambulance service within the Northern Territory. So it is very unique in that, in that space. In that um, St. John NT, that's who I work for at the moment, we're responsible for the ambulance response. Um, and at the moment, we're, it's more focused on an emergency response. They're currently moving towards, as their, as their contract evolves, moving towards embracing that more um, primary healthcare response to sort of have that sort of connection so that we can have um, an introduction of um, community paramedicine across key areas. Um, looking at seeing if that can expand that paramedic practitioner space. And as you can see, we're across those five locations I brought up in a map before. Um, and within the Darwin area, there's four key locations on top of that. The rest, the other top four there, they're all single locations um, responding to a, a key location. And then NT Health has got five hospitals, we highlighted earlier, um, with Darwin having the exception of having the Royal Darwin Hospital and Palmerston Hospital as its two sort of um, key locations. And then on top of that, NT Health has a whole bunch of clinics, which I'll bring up shortly, um, throughout the territory, which generally is staffed with a nurse and a driver, and they provide that um, pre-hospital space that's outside of those five key locations supported um, by care flight and RFES using air assets for air and medical retrieval and response along the way as well. So we just have a quick look at the overall health map of the NT. You can see that there's multiple, multiple little healthcare clinics um, located across. Some of these um, Aboriginal run um, healthcare clinics that we'll talk about in a sec, which I've got a separate slide for that. But you can see that um, between um, Darwin, um, Catherine, um, Null and Boy out there on the right and, and um, Alice Springs, there's all these other little um, clinics that are out there providing this healthcare response. Um, you can see by these colours that they represent areas of urban, rural um, in the Darwin areas and urban and rural in the um, Alice Springs area. And 
it is quite, um, it, it can be quite a challenge um, with those. Being generally staffed with just the nurse and the, uh, and the driver, um, rely heavily on either a St. John response to meet them halfway or a, um, or a response from Royal Flying Doctors or Care Flight in that space as well. And if we move back into our delivery of um, Aboriginal medical services or Indigenous healthcare support services, these are the areas within um, the NT at the moment that work as um, NGOs or partners within um, NT Health to help provide um, various levels of uh, medical assistance within communities. And these are areas in which there are plenty of opportunities for the community paramedicine or paramedic practitioner to evolve into and become key parts of these clinics. Uh, and these are just some of the many clinics that you can see. And you can see where they're situated um, across the territory on that map over there to your right. Um, and they provide a key part in, in this development. And there are many communities, uh, many of these services here that St. John and T is actually working with right now to help evolve the community paramedicine space as we step up into that kind of delivery model to enhance how we can deliver um, these uh, Indigenous healthcare opportunities and growth within um, the NT itself. And there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, there's no magic bullet, there's no magic amount of money. It's trying to work out what service works best for that community that can provide the care and necessities they need um, so that the members within the community can be looked after. And then what do they do if it reaches a point where they need assistance and elevate it through and what processes are in place for that? And if we look into sort of where the future and other opportunities are across the board, um, as I mentioned earlier, there, there are areas and there are gaps in which the paramedic practitioner and community paramedicine model could really fill and provide some significant areas of support um, across the whole network here, both in the remote locations and both in the um, metropolitan locations across the NT as well. And I think some of these systems once implemented could actually prove a foundational process in which they could be adapted across Australia and in many respects, probably internationally as well. Healthcare delivery delivered outside the normal box it sits within. And what I mean by that is, and that's one thing paramedics do exceptionally well is we're presented with the problem. It doesn't always fit perfectly. We're, we're kind of like a round peg trying to go into a square hole. And we work out a way in which we can make that round peg end up in a square hole. We're very good at thinking outside the box. We're very good at trying to implement um, how we can apply that. And I think that's one of the areas and one of the gaps and one of the opportunities in which the, the development of the paramedic practitioner and community paramedicine model as it evolves in Australia, I think this is an area where we can really Whole, move in with the healthcare system that's already there and really help to expand it, really bring in that holistic approach and really move forward in a way that delivers the right care for the right patient with the right resource at the right time and really gives back into those communities. And working alongside AMSAIN, which I brought up before, um, Indigenous Paramedic Development Pathway Programs. And you know what, that's not really limited to just paramedic development. This could be utilised across um, across all avenues of healthcare. I don't believe you need need a need to be a paramedic or need to be a nurse or need to be a doctor. I don't think you need to have all those degrees and the qualifications to provide some kind of health or health promotion or health support within your community. Um, there are there are plenty of areas in which um, we can develop people that might want to go through an entire development process, be it a whole process from um, Cert three, Cert four, diploma right the way through to bachelor, right the way through to a master's degree, people that might go from there and branch into medicine. It could all start with a simple approach um, within the community, delivering a area with, of, of healthcare, um, be it an EN, um, be it a, a paramedic technician, be it an evolved driver, um, be it something that keeps them in their community, keeps them around their family and helps them contextualise health um, within that community. I mean, go back to um, can work out ways in which traditional uh, ways of delivering healthcare in the past have worked and how does that work with current health processes that are in place. Um, and look at this across all health disciplines um, and getting everyone to work in that holistic way. Because um, if we look, at, we look at where systems have worked really well in Australia so far, having that collaborative approach in healthcare where we engage 
um, all aspects of it. So paramedics engaging with other referral services, engaging with the hospital and health system, engaging with mental health, all external, looking at ways in which we can keep people in the community, looking at ways we can keep people within their homelands and evolving these kind of developments and helping fill in these gaps so that we can start to deliver that, I think is really going to start to improve the way in which we deliver healthcare to Indigenous Australians, not only just in the NT, um, but across other areas of Australia and potentially into other developing nations and cultures as well. So that's um, my quick wrap up uh, for sort of where we're traveling and moving at the moment. Um, more than happy to um, ask any questions you might have or um, elaborate more on some of the areas I've touched on. Again, we only had a sort of about 15 to sort of 20 minutes to sort of get through that. It's a massive topic, but hopefully I've covered a lot um, to sort of spark your interest in that space as well. Thanks, Thanks so much, Duncan. Fantastic. Uh, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them through on the chat uh, comment. I might just go and kick it off, Duncan, if you don't mind. Um, sure. I'm quite interested in the, you were discussing the inherent complexity with these remote communities and the Indigenous population. And I'm interested in considering their isolation. Um, what's, what systems or what ideas are in place uh, as far as integrated healthcare teams? I noticed that, that you had a map out there of the, of the healthcare, of the health uh, um, uh, uh, centres that were in different parts of the Northern Territory there, but many of these patients would presumably be able to benefit from social work, from dentistry, physio, other allied health, GP, nursing, a whole range of of, mm. um, of services. And considering the uh, issue with moving them out of country and being able to get them back home as well, uh, what might a, a, an integrated care team look like in those areas? Or is it simply at the moment... Uh, it, it, it too difficult of a task to provide that holistic care. So at the moment, um, there's a the most common way it's been approached, and actually it's been doing this for a while, is the RFDS clinic plane, uh, which goes in and it, it provides sort of that that sort of holistic um, kind of approach. Outside of that, and some of those more remote, what, what do you do in between all of that? Outside of that, um, so sort of the rural and remote access nurse or remote access nurse sort of process or the RAN um, process has sort of been evolved in that space. Um, and that's heavily supported by telemedicine. Um, so they uh, might have the person come in and they could hook up uh, via the telemedicine approach and other aspects like that. But again, that can be presented with some cultural barriers and challenges as well, because um, that's, not, that's not always looked at in a favorable um, approach. Even the way in which we approach dealing with mental health issues, um, the sheer word um, mental health can provide some significant barriers and issues straight away. Um, and there's been examples where um, elders have been involved and paramedic, uh, not paramedic, sorry, Aboriginal practitioners, which is kind of like a, a cert for in um, Aboriginal health management services, sort of come in and be intermediaries that sort of come in and help deal with that in a more culturally appropriate and specific way so it takes away sort of that stigma um, and tries to um, get them engaged in that space instead uh, so it's sort of a bit of a, a long-winded um, response um, but i think um, i do believe some of the many telemedicine and other aspects of approach that we're moving forward with now um, helps um, in evolving that uh, and moving forward um, we're only as good as the technology that's around us. Um, and yeah, that it's, it's one of the, hence the never, never, that picture sort of gives you a bit of a, bit of a key look at that. Um, it, it's one of the biggest challenges of working in that kind of remote location and space. Yeah, uh, you just mentioned before about the in, indigenous uh, for uh, healthcare workers as well. And that led me on to another question that I had in my own mind from the other day um, was, uh, a paramedic in the future paramedic practitioners um would there be value for them to integrate with the existing healthcare teams in this community in the, these communities as well but considering the complexity and culture and language difference across the northern territory there 
Um, would there be opportunities for new healthcare professionals into those spaces, coming into those spaces to uh, have some experience with culture and language to learn um, the area and the, um, and the nuance of that particular population before arriving there? And would those healthcare workers, those Aboriginal healthcare workers, um, be able to assist with that in integrating new healthcare workers into that area and um, assist with promotion of health and, and connection ongoing? Oh, yeah, I think 100% um, that sort of does happen already, and especially the more remote um, locations. Um, I, that comes back to my point of just because someone's got a Cert 4 or a Cert 3 or, or some lower level than like your registered APRA practitioner, medical provider, um, someone that's already part of that community, someone that's already providing that kind of initial support that's sort of done that, that this is their homeland, this is their community, the amount of depth and knowledge um, that a new person coming in can obtain from that is you can't put a price on that. Uh, it's very easy to um, step on cultural barriers uh, when working um, in these locations. And if you're not aware and you're not prepared for that process, you can end up putting yourself on the back foot and you could be there wanting to provide the best service ever, do everything for the people, but if you get off on those wrong, you take those wrong steps at the start, it can take a long time to bring all of that back. Um, and, and cultural orientation is a key part of working within the, in the territory. I know within our service itself, it's a key part of the initial induction process. Uh, and with NT Health, they do a fairly significant um, uh, process and package as well. Uh, and I think that will be a key part of successful implementation of filling these gaps is ensuring that the people that are going out there not only are the right people for the role but they're they're culturally prepared to be able to not only just live in the isolation but understand those nuances um, understand who the people the right the people are that they need to communicate through and not just thinking you need to go up to some random person and talk to them because you might not be able to or there might be something um and knowing when to step in and when not to um step in as well like it's even the um the way in which communication is done. It, it, you need to be retaught how to communicate in many respects because it's not the same as you and I having a conversation right now. There are different nuances. It, it, it can just be small. It can be the slightest little thing and it does not take much um, to completely damage that, that cultural representation that you're trying to build. Thank you. Um, got Naomi here who has a two part question, Duncan. So the first part of it is, do you find the Indigenous community is accepting, is accepting and welcoming of our interventions? And the second part, which follows on is, um, is the wider healthcare community in the Northern Territory accepting of uh, the future role of a paramedic practitioner, prescribing paramedic practitioner? So relating to the first question, um, we generally have, in the, in the areas that we're quite prevalent in, uh, we have a very um, accepting um, feeling across the board. Um, Nullumboy has got um, a lot of uh, areas around it, particularly Urukala, just getting the pronunciation right. Um, they, uh, they have a, a health clinic in there as well, as well as the big hospital that's out at Nullumboy or Gove Hospital um, that was built by BHP. Uh, so they are very welcoming um, in our approach, um, but in saying that, that's taken years and years of building up um, trust, building up understanding, um, building up respect, um, just like you would with any patient. Um, you don't just go in there and do your own thing without actually communicating, without asking first, um, is it culturally appropriate for a male um, paramedic to treat a female um, patient if you've got a female paramedic there that could probably step in and assist with or getting that um the chaperone to be there as well so um always asking explaining exactly what it is you are trying to do uh and just sort of treating it like you would treat any um any patient but making sure that you're um you're, you're following the steps and processes that were already orientated to you um, as far as moving into the paramedic practitioner space, um, I work across uh, many of the northern and central boards that talk about um, changes and development um, within that space, um, as well as the NCCTRC, which is the group that responded to the Bali bombings and other aspects like that. And they 
they're all very interested in where this direction is going. Um, there is no nurse practitioner model properly established here um, in the territory like you have in other states and um, territories in Australia. However, NCCTRC does have a couple of nurse practitioners in their midst now to help with their deployment capabilities. And they're very interested as well in, in seeing how this position evolves or the paramedic practitioner evolves as well because of that sort of pre-hospital care and experience that it brings. Um, because it's sort of, that's what you were sort of, you came up through. So you have that disaster response and that trauma response sort of already built into your psyche and your approach from those years of um, working in that space. And now you're incorporating that, that primary healthcare response on top of that. Um, so it enables you to think a little bit differently when you respond to an event because you're used to working in those austere and, and out there environments where it's not the, nothing's ever the same as sort of more, more in a hospital kind of environment where things are semi the same, but you're in a controlled environment where we've always operated in an uncontrolled environment. And that's where they sort of see the benefits of this process moving forward. Well, thank you very much, Duncan. We might leave it there for tonight. Uh, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, for everyone who's joining us live, thank you so much. And thank you for your questions as well. Uh, this will be uploaded onto YouTube over the next day or so. I wish you all the best. We'll see you next month. Bye. See ya.